Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, Marianne, for inviting me. Uh, I, uh, I used to be like all of you. I used to be a believer. I've heard from various little dicky birds around this building that you, all, all, all the people here in the audience are believers. And I've been doing my own little bit of anecdotal research sitting here. I can see it in your eyes. I can see you all believe in Wikipedia and MySpace and the blogosphere and the rest of the nonsense out there. Um, so uh, I'm here to put you right. I'm here as a gatekeeper to educate you, to hand down some, some wisdom which uh, you won't get uh, online. Uh, I'm full of confessions. The worst or the most shameful confession of all is I used to be like all of you. Uh, I used to be a believer. Um, I was, uh, in fact, one of the original believers. I, I founded Audio Cafe in the mid-90s, extremely evangelical. I would sit in meetings with VCs, and not only would I want their money, which of course really is what all we really want is money, but I also wanted their approval. I wanted them to, to believe in what I was believing. And in the mid-90s, I believed in the Internet. I saw it as a platform for the distribution of high quality content. I still do. I'm not a Luddite. I'm not against the internet. I'm not suggesting that we, we, we turn it into sort of Tehran.com and close the thing down. <laughs> However, um, I did have an epiphany. I went from being a believer to a skeptic. I've had my experience and I'm here today to firstly relate that experience. I'm going to read you a couple of pages from my book. And I'm also going to try to convince all of you to join me in the skeptics camp, because we're growing, and soon we'll be the majority. So probably in five or 10 years, I'll be here making the opposite argument, telling you all why you need to believe in the internet again. So as I said, I was a believer. Uh, founder of Audio Cafe, did all sorts of things, put events like this on. I live in Berkeley, California, West Coast, all the rest of it. Um, held lots of senior positions in sales and marketing companies. And then in the fall of 2004, September, late September, was it October 2004? I guess that was three years ago uh, this month. It seems a long three years. Um, I had my epiphany. This is when uh, I opened my eyes to the reality. I saw what was really going on. I was invited to an event called Friends of O'Reilly, which is the Friends of Tim O'Reilly. And I'm going to read you just a little bit from my book. Am I echoing? Everyone can hear me? My metamorphosis from believer into skeptic lacks cinematic drama. I didn't break down while reading an incorrect Wikipedia entry about T.H. Huxley or get struck by lightning while doing a search for myself on Google. My epiphany didn't involve a dancing coyote, so it probably wouldn't be a hit on YouTube. It took place over 48 hours in September 2004 on a two-day camping trip with a couple of hundred Silicon Valley utopians. Sleeping bag under my arm, rucksack on my back, I marched into camp a member of the cult. Two days later, feeling queasy, I left an unbeliever. The camping trip took place in Sebastopol, a small farming town in Northern California's Sonoma Valley, about 50 miles north of the infamous Silicon Valley, the narrow, the narrow peninsula of land between San Francisco and San Jose. Sebastopol is the headquarters of O'Reilly Media, one of the world's leading traffickers of books, magazines, and trade shows about information technology an evangelizer of innovation to a worldwide congregation of technophiles. It is both Silicon Valley's most fervent preacher and its noisiest chorus. Each fall, O'Reilly Media holds an exclusive invitation-only event called FOO, Friends of O'Reilly Camp. These friends of multimillionaire founder Tim O'Reilly are not only unconventionally rich and richly unconventional, but also harbor a messianic faith in the economic and cultural benefits of technology. O'Reilly and his Silicon Valley acolytes, and this may summarize you guys as well, don't take it personally though, are a mix of graying hippies, 
new media entrepreneurs and technology geeks. What unites them is a shared hostility towards traditional media and entertainment. Part Woodstock, part Burning Man, and part Stanford Business School retreat. Foo Camp is where the countercultural 60s meets the free market 80s meets the technophile 90s. So there we were, 200 of us, Silicon Valley's anti-establishment establishment, collectively worth hundreds of millions of dollars, gazing at the stars from the lawn of O'Reilly Media's corporate headquarters. For two full days, we camped together, roasted marshmallows together, and celebrated the revival of our cult together. The internet was back. And unlike the gold rush 90s, this time around, our exuberance wasn't irrational. This shiny new version of the internet, what Tim O'Reilly called Web 2.0, really was going to change everything. Now that most Americans had broadband access to the internet, the dream of a fully networked, always connected society was finally going to be realized. There was only one word on every foo camper's lip in September 2004. That word was democratization. I never realized democracy had so many possibilities, so much revolutionary potential. Media, information, knowledge, content, audience, author, all were going to be democratized by Web 2.0. The internet would democratize big media, big business, big government. It would even democratize big experts, transforming them into what one friend of O'Reilly called, in a hushed, reverent tone, noble amateurs. Although Sebastopol was miles from the ocean, by the second morning of camp, I had begun to feel seasick. At first, I thought it was the greasy camp food or perhaps the hot northern Californian weather. But I soon realized that even my gut was reacting to the emptiness at the heart of our conversation. I had come to Foo Camp to imagine the future of media. I wanted to know how the internet could help me bring more music to more orifices. But my dream of making the world a more musical place had fallen on deaf ears. The promise of using technology to bring more culture to the masses had been drowned out by Foo Campus' collective cry for a democratized media. The new internet was about self-made music, not Bob Dylan or the Brandenburg concertos. Audience and author had become one, and we were transforming culture into cacophony. Foo Camp, I realized, was a sneak preview. We weren't there just to talk about new media. We were the new media. The event was a beta version of the Web 2.0 revolution, where Wikipedia met MySpace, met YouTube. Everyone was simultaneously broadcasting themselves, but nobody was listening. Out of this anarchy, it suddenly became clear that what was governing the infinite monkeys now inputting away on the internet was the law of digital Darwinism, the survival of the loudest and most opinionated. Under these rules, the only way to intellectually prevail is by infinite filibustering. So I filibustered enough. Um, you get the idea, of course. Let me go back to the key sentence in what I, I read you. Um, before I was a technology uh, entrepreneur, I, was, uh, uh, I, I taught ideology. I'm particularly interested in the way in which ideas come together. And I think that the, that the heart of the matter in terms of this, this Web 2.0 movement is, is a historical coincidence. There's nothing inevitable about it. I'm not a historical determinist. I don't see Web 2.0 as the end or the beginning or the middle of history. But it, it is an interesting moment in history in the way in which everything has come together in Web 2.0. Web 2.0 isn't about technology. I don't care about technology. I barely know how to use it. That's why I don't have a presentation. Um, What's interesting to me about Web 2.0 is it reflects some profound, I would argue even, especially coming from Northern California, seismic shifts in the nature of culture, authority, ethics, and the public space. It really is the first, and I use this word